Hi, girls. I'm Samantha. God bless you for coming on the line to the beautiful worship. It's important to worship the Lord before getting into his word. So tonight is going to be pretty interesting. We heard Sally give a beautiful presentation last week on the believers being salt and light. Glory to God, he really has been revealing so much to all of us. And it's really amazing to be able to share with everyone as a body of believers in Christ. Fellowship together is encouraging. He gave us the word not to keep to ourselves only, but to share it and learn together. So tonight I'm going to be speaking on Christ fulfilling the law, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. So I encourage you to take out your little Bibles and notepad, take down notes. You're ready to ask some questions because we do our fellowship afterwards, which is always fun for us. So I'm going to start reading out of Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And it reads, Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I do not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the stroke of a letter or one iota, which is the smallest Greek alphabet. It's like a little, uh, like a little hyphen. will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So what does all this mean? As I studied these passages, it brought me to the Old Testament and the law, the laws that were set in place for the people to follow, to prepare them, to prepare their hearts, to prepare their houses. Most of all, to prepare their hearts for the Christ, the Messiah that was to arrive. So for us truly to understand what Jesus did and what he meant when he said he came to fulfill the law, we must know what the law is. If you girls will, turn with me to Leviticus 19, verse 2. It says, You must be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. How does one become holy? Well, in the Old Testament, we see all the rules and regulations set in place for the people to follow. And if we read these rules and laws, we can see how difficult it is to really hold the law. So we're going to look at three categories of the law tonight. The first one is the ceremonial. The ceremonial law related specifically to Israel's worship. Primary purpose was to point forward to Jesus Christ. So let's go to Leviticus 1. 1 through 4. It reads, The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd or cattle or your flock or sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head, and the Lord will accept its debt in your place to purify you and making you right with him. So we see that all these ceremonies had to take place in order for the people to be cleansed and made right before the Lord. Just imagine how hard it was to find a perfect animal to sacrifice. Had to be in pristine condition. No defects or corruption was allowed. In order for it to be a sweet aroma to the Lord, this was their worship. This was the only way to be cleansed in that time. These laws were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. While we are no longer bound by ceremonial law, the principles behind them to worship and love a holy God still apply. Jesus was often accused by Pharisees of violating ceremonial law. So number two, the civil law. Civil law applies to daily living in Israel. If you turn with me to Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 14, it says, If you lend anything to your neighbor 
Do not enter his house to pick up the item he is giving as a security. You must wait outside while he goes in and brings it out to you. If your neighbor is poor and gives you his cloak as security for a loan, do not keep the cloak overnight. Return the cloak to its owner by sunset so he can stay warm through the night and bless you. And the Lord will, the Lord your God will count you as righteous. Never take advantage of the poor and destitute laborers, whether they are fellow Israelites or foreign foreigners living in the town. The civil law was given to us for our conduct with others, not taking advantage of others or mistreating anyone, to learn how to love others. Because modern day societies and cultures are so radically different from that time and setting, all of these guidelines cannot be followed specifically. But the principles behind these commands are timeless and should guide our conduct. Jesus demonstrated these principles by example. Number three, the moral law, such as the Ten Commandments, is a direct command of God, and it requires strict obedience. Return with me to Exodus 20, verses 12 through 17. It says, Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long life, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The Golden Rule, Matthew 7, 14. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophet. The moral law reveals the nature and will of God, and it still applies today. Jesus obeyed the law, the moral law, completely. Some of those in the crowds were experts at telling others what to do, but they missed the point of God's God's law themselves. Jesus made it clear, however, that obeying God's law is more important than explaining, explaining them. It's much easier to study God's law and teach them, and to put them into practice. The same applies to us today. How are we doing at obeying God? So we can see, looking at these laws, how difficult it is to keep them. James 2.10 tells us, For the person who keeps all the laws except one is guilty, as a person who has broken all God's laws. And there's only one, really, that could have kept them. And he did. That was Jesus. That was his whole purpose, to fulfill what is impossible for us is only possible through him. So we go back to verse 1 in Matthew 5:17, and see that when Jesus said, don't think that I came to destroy the law of the prophet, but I came to fulfill. He's saying, I didn't come to change or do away with these laws. I meant these laws. They're immutable. My father meant these laws. When he met with Moses on the mountain, they were literally etched in stone. How can we erase something that's in stone? We see that he is a completion and perfection of these laws. Not saying that we shouldn't still be morally right and take up our cross daily. I think we can all agree we know it's wrong to murder, to lie, to steal. Amen? So we build ourselves on the strong foundation of God and his ways. So let's turn to Matthew 7, Matthew 7, 24. It says, Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though so the rain comes in torrents and the flood water rise, and the wind beats against the house, it won't collapse. Because it is built on rock. Who is the rock? Jesus. He is our rock, our solid foundation. These laws were given for his testimony, for his people to be able to exist and know his ways, and the just, righteous, merciful God that we serve. Obedience to the Lord is not strict rule following, as some may point out that we have to be perfect and we have to work for salvation or to keep our salvation. We see a great example of this with Jesus, when the Pharisees accused him of breaking the laws of the Sabbath. 
or when the disciples ate from the fields on the Sabbath. They accused them of breaking God's law, but were they? The law tells us that a person shouldn't plow the field. They didn't do this. They picked some food with their hands, enough to eat, not extra to harvest or to sell, which was allowed. But the Pharisees made it seem like they went against the commandments. By picking the food from the field, they said it was a work on the Sabbath, saying they broke the Sabbath. The Pharisees, the, excuse me, girl. The Pharisees stretched the law so far that even if they had to lift their hand to their mouth to eat, they wouldn't do it because it would break the Sabbath. And reading the New Testament and the Old, you can see that they took God's commandments and made things up along the way because they themselves didn't even practice them or understand them. This can relate to us today. We say, I can have one dream. I can steal one time. I could cheat this one time. I could do this scam one time. It just goes back and forth. Even our government, our lawmakers, do they even follow their own rules? We know most of them don't. So the Pharisees were being hypocrites, like Jesus called them. In Isaiah 29, 13 through 1, it says, And so the Lord says, These people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rot. Because of this, I will once again astound these hypocrites with amazing wonder. The wisdom of the wise will pass away and the intelligence of the intelligent will disappear. So what was Jesus saying that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets? He's the completion of of the law. He's the Messiah that the prophets prophesied about. He fulfilled their prophecies. He's among them. We see often in the New Testament that Jesus gave them scripture to bring to their remembrance that which the prophets spoke of. He is who the prophets were preparing them for. But they refused to acknowledge their Messiah. If we turn to Jeremiah 9, 1 through 6, it says, If only my head were a pool of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, I would weep day and night for all my people who have been slaughtered. Oh, that I could go away and forget my people and live in a traveler's shack in the desert. For they are all adulterers, a pack of treacherous liars. My people bend their tongues like bows to shoot out lies. They refuse to stand up for the truth. They only go from bad to worse. They do not know me, says the Lord. They are all fools. They are all fooled and defraud. They all fool and defraud each other. No one tells the truth. With practiced tongues, they tell lies. They wear themselves out with all their sinning. They pile lie upon lie, utterly refuse to acknowledge me, says the Lord. This is the gospel message. The lawgiver completed the law because we cannot. It is impossible for us, but only possible for him. We are made righteous only through him, by him, and for him. So he is telling us the greatest command to love is to love the father and your brother and your sister. Love is the greatest command that he leaves us. Obedience comes with our faith in Christ. We follow the commandments because we love our Father and we want to please him. And he tells us that the law won't pass away until heaven and earth disappear. So he is making it clear that his law is important. That's why he kept it and completed it for us. And to know his law and his ways is to know the Father we serve. How can we worship a God if we don't know his ways? Hebrews 10.6 tells us, But this is the new covenant I will make with my people of Israel. On that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Amen. Jesus fulfilled the law, and he's saying, The way we keep these things, the way you keep these things is through me. Luke 24:44 says, Then he said, 
When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he completed it. Thank you, Lord. Paul tells us in Galatians 3.23-29, through 29, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we are no longer, we are no longer in need, wait, sorry, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have but, have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ, Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true, true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Praise God. We must understand it's all him, nothing of ourselves. He took our place. He is our advocate to the Father. He washes us clean, white as snow. Amen. I just want to talk to you about the Lord, something the Lord revealed to me. While I was doing this study, he gave me the story of Rebecca and Isaac. Abraham sent his servant to go find him a daughter-in-law, and he told him she would be by the well and she would give him drink, not only for him, but for his camels also. I'm sure you're familiar with this story. If not, you can go and read Genesis 24. A really good story. So Laban, the servant, listened to his master Abraham and went and found Rebecca by the well. And she gave him drink to him and his camel and invited him back to her house, where her father was related to Sarah, Isaac's wife. And Laban asked for permission to take Rebecca back to Abraham to marry Isaac. They told him yes. He lavished her with gifts and the family also. They told the servant, but we want Rebecca to stay with us at least 10 days, her brother and her mother said. Then she can go. But he said, don't delay me. The Lord has made my mission successful. Now send me back so I can return to my master. So they called Rebecca. Are you willing to go with this man? They asked her. And she replied, yes, I will go. So they said goodbye to Rebecca and sent her, her away with Abraham's servant and his men. The woman who had been Rebecca's childhood nurse went along with her. They gave their blessings to her as she parted, and they told her, Our sister, may you become the mother of many millions. May your descendants be strong and conquer the cities of their enemies. Then Rebecca and her servant girls mounted the camel and followed the man. So Abraham's servant took Rebecca and went on his way. So what does this have to do with Matthew 5? Matthew 5 is the gospel. In this story, we can see God sent his servant to purchase us. It's a calling of obedience and faith, and we can see salvation in this message. We can also see the testing of Rebecca based at the water when she offered water for Laban and also for the camel. She was obedient. Rebecca's family and the world around her was trying to call her to stay to live but really die more in the flesh. But when the servant and the family asked Rebecca, will you go? She said immediately, I will go. Her faith and obedience, and that was her faith and her obedience. And immediately she put on, immediately and put out, put, wait, I'm sorry. Where'd it go? And this is, okay. Okay, and this is a question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to salvation. Will we accept immediately and put our trust and faith in him? Or will we say, wait, Lord, a little longer while I live worldly and enjoy life more? Then I'll come to you. Interesting, if you read this story, you see that as soon as she departed to go to her master's house, she had many troubles and trials. 
She had a far journey in riding a camel in the desert. She even fell off the camel. But the little trouble and trial she had was nothing compared to what awaited her. So I just wanted to share that with you all. We will experience a lot of heartache and troubled trials and bumps in the road. The sanctification process. But it's nothing compared to the glory and the majesty that awaits for us to be in his presence. So that leads me to end with the gospel. You may say, I consider myself a good person. Won't that be enough? Romans 3.23 says, We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 5.12 tells us, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. 1 John 1.5 says the creator of the universe is holy. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He has set laws in place for his creation to obey. What are these laws? They begin with the Ten Commandments. While you might consider yourself good compared to most people, how do you measure up against God's law? Have you ever told the smallest lie? Then you are a liar. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Disobedience to God is sin. We say, is sin really that big of a deal? If it is, what hope is there? Well, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Disobedience to an infinite eternal God deserves an infinite eternal consequence. God shows us his character and his laws and his creation, the world around us. He has also written his laws in our hearts, on our conscience. He has also given us his word, the Bible. No good judge would let the guilty go free, the criminal go unpunished. Neither can a holy, righteous God allow sinful man to go unpunished. But God loves man, whom he has made in his image. And he has provided a way of escape by sending his only son to die in our place. So you may say, after what I've done to grieve God, how could he be willing to die in my place? Well, Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the famous John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. While he died on the cross, he was mocked, spit upon, and cursed. Yet Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. With such love, Jesus died in your place, knowing every evil act, word, and thought you would commit. What a powerful love. He loves you unconditionally, even to the point of death. When you are at your worst, So the big question is, how can I be saved? Romans 10, 9 through 10 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You can never be saved by trying to be a good person, nor can you be saved through any amount of good work. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace have you been saved by faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You and I can be saved only by confessing our sins and placing our faith in God's Son. Son. Jesus Christ, who died and paid for our sins on the cross. We must also surrender our life to his Lordship, placing him in charge of every area of our life because we now belong to him. Well, John the Baptist and Jesus himself began their preaching with the word repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To repent means change one's mind or to turn, to go in another direction. How can we be led to repentance? The first step towards repentance is true sorrow for what we've done wrong. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. 
but the sorrow of the world produces that worldly sorrow is more like the regret of a criminal who's just been caught, whereas godly sorrow is the deep remorse or conviction that produces a change in direction. Have you ever felt convicted after doing something wrong? Well, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of our sins, John 16, 7 through 8. So after you you pray out to him and you cry out to him, you ask yourself, did God hear me? Did he accept me? Romans 10, 13 says, for whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. God promises that to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Yes, God does hear and accept all who come to put their faith in him. There is no need to fear death any longer because Jesus broke the power of sin and death on the cross with his own shed blood. The price for your sin has been paid in full, and it is God's promise to receive all who come to him by placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. As a believer, you have a new life in Christ Jesus. Jesus did not remain in the grave. He rose from the dead after three days. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become, becoming new. Second Corinthians 5.17 So what do we do now? Romans 10.17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. We get in his word. We study. We build our relationship with him. We seek him out. We go to him constantly in prayer. We trust. We put our faith completely, solely in him. Amen. Well, thank you, girls, for being patient and bearing with me as I broke these things down much more, but I had to cut it short or we would be here all night. So I pray this reaches our hearts, that the Holy Spirit spoke to us. If anything was said that wasn't supposed to be said tonight, I pray that the, the Holy Spirit blocks your ears and doesn't let it sit on your mind or on your heart. So I pray that you had a blessed night from this, and God bless you, girl.